reviewing and exploring the technology of one of the first non-NVIDIA, non-AMD, and now non-Intel consumer gaming GPUs on the market, the MTT S80, or the More Threads GPU. This is made by domestic Chinese manufacturer More Threads, a company whose founder and CEO was formerly the head of NVIDIA China. And More Threads is a particularly interesting name for this company because Gordon Moore, the original Moore, the one after whom Moore's Law is named, was part of the Traitorous Eight. He defected from uh, Shockley Semiconductor to go to Fairchild and eventually Intel. We know what went on to happen after that particularly famous betrayal of Shockley. Uh, and now there's an NVIDIA former high up employee who has gone on to form a competing company. The biggest difference in this comparison, the traitorous eight where Gordon Moore goes on to found Intel with noise is that this product kind of sucks right now. Uh, it, it is a train wreck for the consumer. It barely works. When you can get a video to play back properly, it's amazing. And if you can get a game to launch, it's groundbreaking for the MTTS80. But it's still important to pay attention to new silicon like this because a lot of companies want NVIDIA's market share. This is one of the first discrete cards to come out of China without simply being a board partner model. But there's a lot more to the story than that. Today, we're going into some of the history and background of More Threads technology, because who knows, they could become a well known player in the market if they can survive these initial rough launches. And we'll be benchmarking the card and looking at the particularly bad power characteristics. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Lexar NM800 Pro Gen 4 SSD. The NM800 is a heavy duty SSD with an included heatsink thermal pad contact to the heatsink, and high transfer speeds across a Gen 4x4 NVMe interface. The Lexar NM800 Pro is available in 512GB, 1TB, and 2TB capacities, and Lexar notes that its included heat spreader, plus its choice of NAND, allows it to run at 7500MB per second sequential read and 6500MB per second sequential write at fastest. Learn more at the link in the description below. We won't get into the political topics in any sort of depth here. It's not really what we do. We focus on technology. But some of the political background is necessary here for context of why this product exists and what's going on. Western chip designers are facing both political and technological pressure to keep their lead right now. Through various sanctions against China, the US has restricted the ability of companies like Intel and Nvidia to sell high-end compute devices to the Chinese market directly. That includes the top of the line AI and deep learning processing devices that Nvidia makes, like the 100 series. Following these rulings and the instantaneous drought of high end AI devices, China has moved to birth a semiconductor industry out of necessity if it wishes to get easier access to such devices. But semiconductors are hard to make. Even a company with literally hundreds of billions of dollars, at least in market cap, and tens of billions of dollars in fabs. Intel has struggled to get its Arc GPUs into a state where they are viable for consumers. And that is a company with decades of experience designing silicon and manufacturing it, and it wasn't easy for that. We shouldn't underestimate any company that wishes to be a silicon manufacturer if it has significant money behind it, and particularly government money. And to be very clear, government money flows pretty freely between all of these silicon designers and manufacturers. Uh, doesn't matter where they're from. But to even dream of competing with existing designers will require billions of dollars. And that's not to mention the years it takes to build a first party fab if more threads wants to use a domestic one. Now, suffice to say, there are political motivations for companies like this to pop up. And that's why there are actually multiple China based GPU manufacturers that have sprung up from nothing in the last few years. And that's also the extent to which we're going to cover any amount of political discussion here. It's not the objective of the channel, but it's very important context because otherwise you sort of look at these things and you go, but why? And that's the answer. It's time to get into some of the marketing claims for the MTT S80, which is more threads, highest end consumer focused cards and also go through additional history and the driver nightmares. For marketing, some of More Thread's claims are so incredible as to be questionable. In its early announcements of the S80 GPU that we're reviewing today, its shorthand performance numbers, namely teraflops, drew comparisons to the RTX 3060 Ti and the RTX 3060. That'd be a massive threat to incumbent GPU manufacturers if true, because it'd effectively be launching ahead of the earliest Arc Silicon's original performance. 
In that way, it seems unbelievable that anyone could compete with Intel on a first revision GPU. Intel, again, had IGPs for over a decade as a background, not to mention competition for the world's most advanced silicon fabs. And it still struggled. But that's not MTT's only ambitious claim. The company also states that its GPU is the first GPU for, quote, meta computing a concept it also introduced. As far as we can tell, metacomputing just means general purpose GPU, which is something that already exists, as a combination of gaming, AI and machine learning, and IoT processing. Now, this phrase was coined by MTT back when meta, as in Facebook, was the buzzword of the day a couple years ago, and every old person you know was asking you if they should invest in the metaverse, to which you were probably replying, Video games have existed forever. Why didn't you care then? Now, for this card, we have this on loan from a viewer, Tyler. Thank you, Tyler, who uh, sent it out to us after buying it online. He bought it for about $600 US. Its MSRP appears to be around $400 US, and it often includes a motherboard bundled in with that for a total price of about 420 bucks. As we were doing our research, we found that there's a lot of inaccurate material out there about more threads, but especially the S80 GPU. And that's because it often goes through multiple layers of translation where the meaning gets lost. So here's the history. More Threads is a company founded by John Dianzhong, which is the former VP and general manager of NVIDIA China for more than 17 years. His English name, simply James Zhang. He oversaw NVIDIA's expansion into China from the mid 2000s up until 2020. The company, MTT, was founded in October of 2020, and it posted a massive number of job listings immediately after and announced that it had developed a fully domestic GPU as of November of 2021. That's less than a year from the company's start and hiring timeline to the actual design of silicon, which in the world of silicon is an unbelievable claim once again. And we'll come back to that one. In March of 2022, the company unveiled the 12 nanometer SUD chip and the gaming capable S60 card based on it. All of More Thread's GPUs, including the S80, are based on the MUSA architecture or More Thread's unified system architecture. In a move that sets collegiate citations back a decade, the Wikipedia entry on this, unfortunately, is erroneous. It cites a Tom's Hardware article that says the architecture is called Twin Xiao. However, that's actually the name of the S80 chip. The architecture itself, though, is called MUSA. Based on a video by Korean YouTuber Bulls Lab, it's been widely reported that this is actually based on PowerVR architecture, and the Twin Xiao chip used by the S80 is specifically the same IMG B series BXT321024 chip great name, that InnoSilicon licensed to create the Fungua One GPU. A lot of these secondary reports in English have misinterpreted the original statements. Bull's Lab has only circumstantial evidence for these claims. However, Bull's Lab is on the right path because the timeline for Musa was simply unrealistically fast. And PowerVR IP has been openly licensed in order to make a different Chinese GPU. As far as we can tell, those are the only hard facts that we have behind this. PowerVR and Imagination Technologies particularly relevant here because Imagination Technologies, if you don't know it, is probably best known for its former Apple allegiance. One of the other things we were struggling with confirming while working on this GPU is the process node used for the silicon within the card here. There's one outlet that reports it's seven nanometer silicon, which basically points us to probably only one fab. There's another report that we saw, actually multiple, that state 12 nanometers. None, however, have a real source. It all appears to be just either guesses or secondary information. Now, we've reached out to more threads and we asked for some additional information to answer these questions, but thus far they haven't responded. More Threads has launched a few GPUs to date. For the consumer in the gaming market, it has the MTT S60, its lowest end, and then it also has the MTT S70 and the S80 that we have today. The company has also shipped what it calls digital office products, so basically just display cards. Those are the MTT S50, the S30, and the S10. And it's also shipped an all-in-one cloud server option called the MCCX VDI. As far as we can tell, 
MCCX has to do with its meta computing buzzword. And there are high end data center cards that we've covered in the past in news, like the S3000 and the S2000. But none of that matters if the cards kind of suck. And right now, they do. Actually, they. They are a lot of suck at the moment. The MTTS80, in our experience, is effectively completely unusable, at least for people who are used to the types of cards we typically review. It doesn't work with many games. It frequently has crashes and driver issues. So let's talk about the drivers. For us, the driver experience largely consisted of using the computer through Google Lens Translation. The More Thread software is called PES Control Center. PES stands for Perfect Experience System. It's an ambitious name. We'll see if they can ever do it. As of now, its function boils down to monitoring. There are no real controls other than the ones that Windows already exposes, like resolution, refresh rate, and screen rotation. The card recognized and supported our 1440p 144Hz and our 4K 60Hz monitors we tested with, and according to more threads, it should support up to 360Hz at 1080p. However, we saw no indication that the card could detect or utilize variable refresh rates on either our G-Sync or our FreeSync displays. There's also no way to choose between GPU or display scaling, and even in simple applications like Steam, we struggled with slow loading times and laggy responsiveness because of the lack of hardware acceleration support. On the monitoring tab in the PES software, there are graphs for GPU utilization, GPU clock, GPU temperature, VRAM utilization, fan RPM, GPU power, CPU utilization, and system memory utilization. These graphs can also be displayed in an overlay, but we found the overlay to be inconsistent about appearing on top of full screen games. It's a good start though. Surprisingly, the S80 seems mostly integrated into Windows Task Manager, with options for more detailed workload breakdowns like video, encode, and decode. Some values, like temperature, clocks, and RPM, can't be seen through any software we tried except PES Control Center. Now, finally, in the software, there's a dedicated tab that links to Maliam, which MTT says is an in-browser, AI-generated content creation platform. This requires WeChat to function properly, but there are enough visible prompts that we get the gist. You enter a prompt, you get an AI-generated image back. It doesn't appear to utilize local hardware. There's also a checkbox in the control center to accept community driver updates, which originally we thought meant drivers developed by the community, but upon further inspection, it appears to mean beta driver testing by the community. Now, the control center may be threadbare overall, but that also means it's simpler to use than any of the AMD, NVIDIA, and Intel equivalents, especially Intel right now. And that's even without being able to read Chinese. Every part of the More Threads ecosystem, by the way, from the website to the software, is exclusively in Chinese characters, which is a little unusual in context. And that's because when we bring products into review from, say, AliExpress, Taobao, JD, from companies that are much smaller and less funded, like Arin, which made the motherboard we looked at not long ago, uh, and Yestin, which makes the video cards we frequently reference, a lot of those companies desperately try to have any amount of Western presence. But this is much different, where here, as far as we can tell, More Threads is completely uninterested in investing effort trying to reach a different market than China. Getting into some of the technology then, the GPU is detected as PCIe Gen 5. That was one of their big claims. As a reminder, that's irrelevant unless you can utilize the bandwidth. So it doesn't really matter, but they do say PCIe Gen 5, and it is rebar supported. In fact, it's heavily uh, insisted that you should use it, kind of like Intel Arc. For feature support though, this GPU only supports DirectX 11, and that's up to 11.1, with no support for DX12. We struggled to get some Vulkan applications to run, uh, and actually even a lot of DX11 applications barely run uh, anyway. A hardware accelerated GPU scheduling isn't an option that's presented in Windows with this GPU. Again, applications like Steam just can't use it that way. And More Threads provides a list even of recommended motherboards. The list is 49 units long now, and it is specifically for boards that support rebar. Of course, there are many more than that. Those are the ones they validated. Likewise, More Threads has a list of explicitly supported games, and it's very short. Official support extends to these games. We'll put them in Google Translate to make it a little easier, although they're not all literal translations. Minecraft RTX was listed in here. Diablo 3 is available. Need for Speed 3 or Need for Speed 11, however you want to count the Hot Pursuit series. Several games we haven't heard of, and then a lot of two-dimensional indie titles that 
frankly, should be easy to run on any type of hardware. Minecraft RTX was a bit of an interesting one because uh, we didn't think this card could do ray tracing because it doesn't support DirectX 12. So we tried it and it doesn't work. What they actually mean is Minecraft is supported. We additionally had frequent issues with black screens when attempting to launch various software. Most games won't even open. And for those that do, several of them have rendering issues. GTA 5, for example, despite using DX11, is problematic because its menu renders as a black background with white text in the foreground rather than the usual game art background. It's often even just a 2D image. The mouse doesn't render at all in GTA 5, and you can navigate the menu using the usual tab, backspace, and enter. Once getting past the navigational nightmare and into a benchmark pass, it presents more rendering issues that range from as simple as FPS counters being the wrong color to as frustrating as the game is just straight up crashing, and everything in between, like texturing issues, mesh issues, shadow flickering, Z fighting, and things of that nature. And that's not to mention the low frame rate, even at 720p. In games where the card does work, we noticed that input sometimes stops working and requires alt tab to re-engage. This seems to be related to what Windows perceives as the active window. So there are some low level Windows compatibility challenges that MT will have to overcome as well. In games that work relatively well, like CSGO and Diablo 3, which is listed explicitly as supported, but Diablo 4 isn't, we noticed occasional hard stutters that cause a visible pause in frame throughput. This will show up well in our FPS charts later, with 0.1% lows in the single digits, despite okay average frame rate. Comparing results between the MTTS80 and other cards is difficult, and it's often non-linear, because the MTTS80 doesn't always render graphics properly. A lot of times games will pop up warnings telling you that you just don't have compatible hardware. One example of render issues is incendiary grenades in CSGO, which render a flickering black box at the point of origin for the grenade. We also saw again mesh rendering, or the actual sort of base of the 3D object, and texture rendering problems. Time to get into the benchmarks. For these, we eliminated anything that just simply didn't run, which was most of our standard suite, and instead we kept them simple. We ran games that seemed compatible, we tried to give it a couple of best case scenarios, and we chose games that were at least somewhat known in the English speaking market, like CSGO, Diablo 3, and the explicitly supported Need for Speed. We also reran the GTX 750 Ti back through the suite, which is a card from 2014, and it was around $150 at the time it was popular. CSGO is up first. After a number of games didn't launch, we were excited to see Counter-Strike work. Counter-Strike is a DX9 game still, so that definitely contributes to the compatibility. But as a reminder, even DX11 games, which are supported, had trouble launching. The S80 ran at about 44 FPS average with lows anywhere from 4 FPS 0.1% in the worst pass up to 20 FPS 0.1% in the best pass. The performance was highly variable, but ultimately frame to frame consistency is just objectively bad. The average is okay, it's just too stuttery in throughput. The 750 Ti from 2014 ran at about 91 FPS average in an identical test. In this instance, the S80 is worse than half the performance of an ancient low-end video card. We have some more modern cards on this chart as well, like Intel's A750 at 306 FPS average, the stark contrast between a $400 S80 under best pricing circumstances, and a $250 A750 illustrates the advantage of incumbency and the experience that Intel holds. Both of these companies were working on their GPU efforts around the same time, but MTT is brand new to all of this. Time to look at a frame time chart. This shows frame to frame interval in milliseconds, lower is better, and more consistent is best. This illustrates the pitfalls of the S80 pretty clearly. First, we'll plot just the worst test pass of the MTTS80. What we want to see is a line with a plus or minus deviation of less than 8 milliseconds, where 16.67 milliseconds total frame time would represent a 60 FPS number if sustained. In this instance, we see okay frame times that are around 25 or 26, so something like 40 FPS, but they're interrupted by spikes, rendering the game largely unplayable if at any kind of competitive level. The spike to 350 milliseconds is one of the worst we've seen in years. That's one third of a second, and you're just staring at the same frame and waiting for the next one during that whole time. The game looks frozen for that third of a second. In CSGO, that's enough to lead to, obviously, a very frustrating death. Other spikes aren't as bad, but we see a couple to around 100 milliseconds or beyond, which is still a hard stutter in gameplay. One of the other test passes is much more consistent, though, so this one represents a far smoother experience and one that's actually fairly playable. 
It still had a hard spike around frame 470, but it's smoother and acceptable. It's just slower at around 40 to 45 FPS. The 750 Ti puts a much flatter line out, indicating less variability, and of course it was also just a higher frame rate. Next, we'll look at the best scenario for the S80 that we tested. We ran a one-off round of Diablo 3 using actual in-game play against only the GTX 750 Ti. In the last game, the 750 Ti doubled the S80's performance. In this one, the S80 runs significantly faster at 85 FPS average. It's still not anywhere close to the performance of a 3060 Ti, which we haven't bothered including since it became CPU bound in some test scenarios, but it's mostly playable. The biggest red flag, and really the only reason we included this chart, is that even with the 750 Ti and its poor average, it still has better lows and consistency, leading to a smoother experience. We ran this at 4K since it's a relatively lightweight title, and we needed the S80 to be under 100% load to really properly test it. Here's the Diablo 3 frame time chart. Plotting just two of the S80 passes, and they are all the same, this kind of gives you an idea for what the frame to frame play was like. The same trend emerges. It's completely playable. It has fine frame times, but they're interrupted by massive spikes upwards of 280 milliseconds. We played for a while with this card, and we found that although it wasn't experience ruining, the frequency of these spikes at several per minute was enough to definitely be annoying and potentially be fatal in dungeon settings if you were to play on higher difficulty levels. Need for Speed Hot Pursuit Remastered was listed as supported, so we bought that just for this review. The game ran at 2.5 FPS average, uh, and that was at 720p low, by the way, and it held 3.6 FPS average at 1080p low also. So to be clear, neither of these results is useful. It is a literal slideshow. The higher FPS at 1080p doesn't mean it's doing better here. It just means that the resolution didn't affect the performance and that it's so low overall that we can't even get a real picture of what the performance is. Or, well, we do, it's just, it's bad. The 750 Ti was way beyond 60 FPS here. We didn't bother fully testing it because when you're running less than 3 FPS, the actual result is fail. We also ran power tests. The MTT S80 has an EPS 12 volt connector, the kind for the CPU, and that's its primary source of power. It also pulls power through the PCIe slot. This is maximally rated for 66 watts of 12 volts, or 75 in total. The GTX 750 Ti we used only pulls from the PCIe slot. Using an interposer to test the slot and then using a current clamp for the rest, here's a simple AB chart. At idle, the power consumption is completely insane on the MTT S80. The card ends up pulling about 114 watts total, or about 50 watts, through the PCIe slot alone. That is crazy high for doing nothing. The GTX 750 Ti, for reference, pulled about 15 watts in this scenario. Gaming scenarios had the MTT S80 between 120 and 146 watts, with CSGO being the only game to fully load the MTT S80 at 160 watts. The entire time, the card was pulling about 60 watts through the slot, and the remainder through the EPS 12 volt cable. It seems like it always pulls 60 through the slot, no matter what, so maybe something's just not working right. It's very high slot power draw, and none of this is to mention the efficiency or the effective frames per watt, which is among the worst we've ever seen with the S80. So now we're gonna do a quick teardown of this card. We're gonna do this on one of our medium anti-static mod mats. You can grab one on store.gamersnexus.net. And if you get one of these model mediums, it'll come with these two additional pinout cards and a PCIe pin uh, with the 12 volt ground outlined on it. Okay. Teardown looks pretty simple. So this thing has a tiny, the world's tiniest flow through area because they wanted it to look like the logo, I guess. And we're just gonna take out a bunch of Phillips screws and see what's underneath. I forgot to mention this too, as part of that AMD documentary we did, uh, if you buy one of the autographed version of this mat or any other mod mat from the store for the next couple days, you will get one that is signed not only uh, by me, which is normally I'm the one who signs them, but also by Vitaly and Mike from the video team that did the AMD tour. So you can grab one of those on the store if you want to get a special version of it. This appears to be an aluminum backplate. Oh, wow. What the hell? Wow, that's easy. 
So for the fans, the outer fans are larger diameter than the central one. We use the tachometer to verify the RPM. Under load, these ones spin up to about 1800 or so RPM. The central one spins up into the uh, 1700s a lot of the time. So that's the fan configuration. And actually, it's a little bit of a mess in there. There's a lot of cables. So this cable's connecting all the fans to the actual host PCB. And then we've got three cables for each of the fans plugging into that PCB, and then one more for the LED in the central ring. Otherwise, the chassis is completely metal. Most of it feels like aluminum. Here's the fin stack. So the card claimed it stayed in the 50s most of the time we were testing it, but it also wasn't doing a whole lot of work. And we don't know if we can trust the GPU sensor because zero third-party tools work with it. But the fin stack is pretty standard. They've got four heat pipes crossing the middle here. And uh, we need to see what the GPU looks like. But the most interesting thing is the power here. So they are adapting, we'll look at what that is in a second, a power connector out of the PCB into a cable and then running a cable under the heat sink out to the actual power connector EPS 12 volt at the end. And the reason they're doing this is because the PCB itself cuts off here at, at, uh, before the fin stack. They didn't want the cable, I guess, in the middle of the card sticking up, so they adapted it, which is what the, um, I think it was the 2060 did, or the 1060. Really not a good solution. It's, it's, it's a mess, but normally better off exiting the cable in the middle. Interestingly, the actual screws to retain the cooler to the GPU are on this side. I do like how accessible it is so far. This is great to be able to get into the card with this little amount of effort. <laughs> it's funny to, funny to see the GPU. All right, so they've got thermal pads for the memory. The memory is a complete chaos, this layout. This is like some kind of weird TIE fighter wing style, <laughs> but normally these are just in a straight line with some top, some bottom. So they've butted them inwards to avoid the screw holes. Uh, I'm not sure why they did that. That looks like it's supposed to be some kind of ground or something here. So that's a little bizarre too. I've never seen that in a video card that is. So the GPU is labeled SD102AA-500. It's very similar to NVIDIA's labeling for its GPUs. Uh, the SD almost certainly stands for SUD, which is the name of this chip. The 102 means it's probably their biggest die. Maybe the S3000 will be a 100. It's like a literal copy of NVIDIA's naming, which is always weird when companies do that. Cause like, it's kind of like when AMD copied Intel's naming originally, uh, where you're looking at it going, these companies do realize the name isn't what contains the technology, right? Like, but anyway, it's identical naming to NVIDIA's. 500 appears to be their high end. Uh, the cooler itself, copper slug in the middle, nickel plated copper plate, very standard construction. Fin stack is oriented top to bottom, and I don't really have any complaints or anything. This is this is pretty straightforward. Their MOSFETs are spaced very far apart. So the power design is kind of wild where you can see the MOSFETs taking the space of what typically would be like 12. The power is also very abnormal. I want to get in here and see if it's just a metal plate hiding a cable. Yep, it's just hiding a cable. It's not really a great design. Gigabyte's done it. NVIDIA has done it on FE cards, so certainly this isn't the first time. Just kind of weird. They, they try to hide it, though. So that's it for the teardown. The cooler is pretty standard, and assuming we can trust the sensors at all, it seems to be doing the job. It's just that the card isn't doing that much. So that's kind of all there is to the physical construction of the card. The conclusion to this is pretty simple, because the answer simply is that you should not buy this card. It, isn't even really meant for enthusiasts, at least not enthusiasts in our typical audience. Maybe if you were in China, it would make sense as sort of an enthusiast thing to play around with. 
But still, anything from NVIDIA, AMD, or even Intel right now, or especially Intel actually, would be a far better value, far better compatibility, much less frustrating. None of these things are really surprising. When you're talking about a new player entering the market with a different architecture, and uh, you know, Intel Arc had trouble getting its footing, but it started in a much better place than this did, and it's a way more funded company with far more experience, manufacturing abilities, contacts, things of that nature. So when Intel first launched, our conclusion was don't buy the Intel Arc cards unless you're an enthusiast and you want something interesting to play around with. This card's a little bit worse even than that because it's just don't buy it. But it is interesting. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why the viewer who loaned it to us bought it. My instinct or my gut reaction tells me collector's item. Uh, or maybe just doing some research for the technology. And those are the primary reasons you would buy it. But that doesn't make the conclusion less interesting because what came out of this from our testing is that it does technically work. It doesn't work well, and it doesn't always work, but it does function. And getting a GPU to function at all, and especially being able to play a kind of modern game like Diablo 3 at, say, 80 FPS with reasonable settings, uh, it was pretty high resolution. I think we did that one at 4K. Yeah, those are, that's a good starting place. And more threads and other upstart silicon manufacturers shouldn't be discounted because even though it is easy to say funny, haha, card doesn't run games from 10 years ago and loses to a 2014 card, yeah, that's, that's the easy job to make, but this is still impressive. And uh, if they don't completely flounder and lose all of their funding, who knows? Maybe they could become semi-competitive. But right now, very clearly, there is not only uh, completely unreliable performance, but when it's behind, it's behind cards from, uh, what is that, nine years ago? And is five times the price, uh, worst case, or maybe if we're being charitable, let's call it two and a half to three times the price of those cards from nine years ago. Regardless, More Threads has an interesting story because being effectively a mutiny from NVIDIA and a founding of a competing company, that makes for fun storytelling. We'll see if they can survive and if they're competitive enough to get any kind of foothold whatsoever. What we do know is that the cards have been selling out at least as they pop up available to us. So we've mostly looked at JD, Taobao, and AliExpress. And in all three of those instances, they've been gone pretty quickly. So not sure who's buying them exactly or how many are selling in the market that's more intended for it in China, uh, but they are selling. Anyway, we're really curious what you all think. There's a couple other cards like this out there that we want to look at. It's really just for fun. It's it's. For years, we've been stuck with only AMD and NVIDIA. Intel has been really exciting to get in there because it's probably the only company anyone trusted to actually maybe be able to make a real play at competing with the existing two. Uh, and we need a third player desperately in GPUs, and Intel has brought that. That's why now, when we have two players that refuse to come to grips with reality on their price to performance, that third player sees it as an opportunity to change status quo and take what the others have forfeited. But when it's only two, there's not much reason to change course and you just stay with the inertia. So if more than a third pops up, in the very least, it will probably continue to push the existing known brands to uh, further compete or continue competing beyond just technology, and that means price competition. But right now, More Threads is really not a threat to anyone in the market. Uh, whether that changes is kind of irrelevant to today's review, because today's review is don't buy the S80, but it was fun to work on and it was different, uh, even if most of the fun was in fact the low-hanging fruit of laughing at it when it couldn't launch really old video games. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. We just uploaded that Patreon Ask GN episode recently if you want to check that out uh, and also help support us at the same time. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.